He's been in this family's life for years. You know, he's a patriarchal figure in these children's lives, and he's been a family friend, so she's never had any reason to worry about her children's safety around him. She doesn't have any real concerns with just falling asleep and leaving her kids awake to play video games while he is in the house. Hi there. I'm Yardley. I'm Dan. And I'm Dave. And this is Small Town Dicks. Dave and I are identical twins, and we're retired detectives from Small Town USA. Together, we've investigated thousands of cases, from petty theft to sex crimes, from child abuse to murder. Every case in our podcast is told by the detective who investigated it, offering a rare, personal account of how they broke the case. Names, places, and certain details, including relationships, have been altered to protect the privacy of the victims and their families. And although we're aware that some of our listeners may be familiar with these cases, we ask you to please join us in continuing to protect the true identities of those involved out of respect for what they've been through. Thank Thank you. you. Today on Small Town Dicks, we have the usual suspects, and it is very, very good. We have Detective Dan. Good morning. Good morning. We have Detective Dave. Great to be here. Great to have you. And Small Town Fam, it gets even better because this case comes to us from our favorite detectives, D&D. So gentlemen, take it away. So... This case occurred within a first year or two of my promotion to detective, and my specific caseload was child abuse and sexual assault. That was 90-plus percent of what landed on my desk. And Dan was still on patrol at the time. So Dan is actually the officer that gets called out in a patrol capacity out to an apartment complex in the east side of our town, middle of the night, and he gets called out to a hit-and-run some driving complaint with a dispute attached to it. When he gets there, he finds out this is bigger than that. So at the time I was working graveyard as a patrol officer and dispatch was having a little trouble with the caller and her name is Diane. She was very emotional, but some basic details that came out of the initial 911 call were that there was a dispute at Diane's house and the male who was involved in that dispute, a guy named Bradley, had left in a hurry, got in his car, and backed out of the driveway and committed a hit and run. Had actually run into part of the building when he was leaving in such haste. When I arrived, what I found out from Diane was that she had some friends over, including Bradley. And how old is Bradley, roughly? Bradley's late 20s. And then we have Lauren, who's maybe first, second grade. Uh, Her brother is a couple years older than her, but certainly Will is also in elementary school. Bradley's girlfriend, late 20s. And then her son, Mandy, brought her son to this party. He's infant, toddler age. And Diane is in her 20s as well, a young mom? Yeah, so Will and Lauren's mom is probably early 30s. Okay, got it. So... There's four total adults. So you have Diane, her friend. He's not a romantic interest. He's just hanging out. You have Bradley and his girlfriend, Mandy. And then you have the three kids, Lauren, Will, and Bradley and Mandy's infant toddler son. The adults are getting more and more intoxicated as the night goes on. So that prompts Mandy to put her son down to bed up in Lauren and Will's room. Lauren and Will are just playing video games in Lauren and Will's room. And at some point, Mandy has drank enough and she needs to recover. So she goes up to Lauren and Will's room and gets in bed next to her child. Are Lauren and Will in their own room? So Mandy has just passed out on one of their beds. On one of their beds. Okay. And they're still in there. Yes. Got it. Three other adults are downstairs still drinking. So... What we gather from interviews with Will and Lauren is that Bradley at some point breaks away from Diane and the other adult male who are hanging out downstairs. And he says he's going to go upstairs and check on Mandy and company. And 
Bradley grabs a beer on his way upstairs. About that time, Diane is thinking, I should probably go to bed too. Bradley's been in this family's life for years. He's not an uncle, but, you know, he's a patriarchal figure in these children's lives. And he's been a family friend. So she's never had any reason to worry about her children's safety around Bradley or anybody else. So Diane doesn't have any real concerns with just falling asleep and leaving her kids awake to play video games while Bradley is in the house. And so Bradley sees that Mandy is asleep. He sees that Diane is now asleep. He waits a little bit, keeps drinking his beer. He's watching Will and Lauren play video games. Lauren at some point says, okay, I'm going to go to bed. And she goes over to mom's room and sleeps at the foot of the bed. Will's still playing video games. His door's open. There's a landing outside his door that leads to the other bedroom in the bathroom. Bradley peeks into Diane's room, sees Lauren on the foot of the bed, and he's doing the, psst, hey, come out here. Will sees Bradley kind of beckoning Lauren to come out of Diane's room and join him just outside his room on this landing. And Bradley coaxes her out of the room, not forcefully, but like, hey, just come with me. And that's his moment of opportunity. And that's the location where he's going to sexually offend. And Will is still playing his video games, but is kind of seeing what's going on out of the corner of his eye. What's going on out in the landing? He's not thinking bad things. He's playing his games. So eventually Will hears Lauren. She starts crying. Credit to Lauren and her mother and however way that Diane communicated this to her daughter and her son about if you're ever uncomfortable. Lauren was empowered with mom's direction. If you ever don't like something, raise hell and start screaming. And that's what Lauren did. And... Diane wakes up to the sound of Lauren crying. Bradley is already on his way down the stairs when Lauren turns to mom and says, Mommy, he touched my privates. It's the Priceline Negotiator, and I'm here because I'm tired of you getting less. Less sunshine, less fun, less bang for your buck. It's time for more. That's why I'm getting you up to 60% off your favorite hotels, along with exclusive deals on rental cars and flights. Because when you save more, you can do more. More sunshine, more fun, a lot more for your dollar. Every trip is a big deal, so visit Priceline.com to get more out of your next trip. So when Lauren started crying, Bradley knew, oh shit, I've got to gather up my hammered girlfriend and her little toddler boy, and we have to get out of this apartment right now because the shit is about to hit the fan. So Diane races down the stairs. Bradley's got his girlfriend, Mandy in tow, and her young son, and Diane says, Bradley, did you touch my daughter? Bradley replies, I didn't touch her. Ask Will. Will is now present while this dispute happens. He's now downstairs and Will tells Diane, I did see Bradley put his denim jacket over Lauren and they laid down together. Diane asks Lauren again, did he really touch your privates? Referring to Bradley and Lauren is really emotional at this point. Lauren says, what is going on? What's happening here? And Diane then turns to the other adult friend who's at the house and asks, hey, don't let Bradley leave. And that friend says, I don't want to be involved in this. And at that point, leaves. Like he just didn't want the drama. Bradley gets everyone in the car of his party Mandy and her son, and he, in his haste, puts the car in reverse, and he hits 
another building across the way from Diane's apartment. You can picture this scene of suspect with girlfriend and little baby in tow scrambling to get out of this apartment, get into the car, get everyone situated, throw it in reverse. You got angry Diane screaming and Bradley isn't driving well because he's got some shit on his mind. And he's intoxicated. Right. So we have this hit and run, but the chaos of the situation isn't overstated here. Like it's a chaotic scene in the middle of an apartment complex in the middle of the night. And you have to understand too, I'm trying to get these details. Diane is beside herself. I'm sure the world's going a million miles a minute. And this is why dispatch had a tough time on the original 911 call because Diane is understandably upset. Right. While I'm talking with Diane at the apartment, her phone rings a couple times and it's Bradley. She doesn't answer the phone and he does not leave a message. I'm asking her questions like, where does Bradley live? Where does Mandy live? Do they live together? I've also got other officers doing area check to see if they can locate Bradley driving. And do Bradley and Mandy live together? It's unclear. We know they've been dating for a while, but we don't know if Bradley actually lives with Mandy. Diane didn't say he's at his apartment and this is the address? That's the issue is Diane knows this guy, but there's no set residence where Bradley has rested his head for the last four years. It's not the situation. Okay. So as Diane grows more and more upset while she's trying to give me details, Lauren is becoming more upset too because A, she just had something traumatic happen to her. And now her mom, her protector, is going through the roof. And at some point, Will, little young man, turns to mother and his sister and says, you guys have to calm down a little bit, which was kind of a jaw dropper for me. He's under 10 years old and he's like the man of the house. I was so impressed with this young man that night. Will just had composure, which is great because I know what's on the horizon for Lauren and it's a trip to the hospital. You know, normally we'd have a parent drive their child down to the hospital to get a sexual assault exam done. But Diane's been drinking. I'm not going to call an ambulance in this situation. I don't think it's appropriate to call an ambulance. Nobody's in immediate danger. So I drive Diane and Lauren and Will to the hospital. My sergeant says, hey, make sure you gather evidence before you take them down there. So I got photos of the apartment, the areas where everyone is describing where the incident took place. I gathered some other evidence. I take Will, Diane, and Lauren down to the hospital and get them checked into the emergency room and let the charge nurse know what's going on and what we need. And the nurse came back out after her examination and said, I got a little more detail from Lauren. You know, we've talked about forensic interviews of children. I'm not trained in that. So I'm not going to try to get a bunch of details out of Lauren. I'm going to be supportive. If she makes a statement, I'm going to record it, but I'm not going to ask a bunch of follow-up questions. I'll let the nurse do that, and I'll let my brother do that once he gets involved and the forensic interviewer at the Child Advocacy Center. You got to know your role. And at this point, my investigation is kind of over with. So I leave the hospital, I write a report, and I forward it back to the detectives, and it just so happened to be assigned to my brother. Cool. So this case came in on an early Sunday morning, and it wasn't a typical Sergeant Dave saying, what are you doing at two in the morning? (laughs) (laughs) I didn't get called out on this one. And it's because of the determination that Dan and the Sergeant made that night, which was, we don't know where suspect is. We know that he doesn't live here, so we don't have to worry about Lauren and Will. There's no way to do a safety plan with this suspect because nobody knows where to find him. So by the time it lands on my desk, everything's calmed down and I start trying to game plan this. Who's Bradley? Where do I find him? This is one of those where I would have immediately tried to get as much information on Bradley as possible and gone into some of our law enforcement databases 
to determine a history of addresses to start looking for Bradley. I don't have that. And is that because Bradley hasn't had any contact with police, so he's like not in your system? Bradley does have contact with the police, but in our system, Bradley has four different AKAs, also known as aliases. And it's a mix of his name with made-up names. And what would the purpose of that be? Well, you don't want to be identified by the police, or you're running from citations, so you do a slight variation on your name, and all of a sudden... You're not with the DMV records, you're sort of in the wind. Right. Hard to track down. So Bradley's used a few different names with law enforcement. I've got to get Lauren forensically interviewed at our advocacy center. So the crime occurs and I couldn't get Lauren in for a forensic interview for at least a week after that. This gives you an idea of the scope of the problem in my county. It's because all the other slots are filled with other children who have either witnessed domestic abuse or are victims themselves. And it's nonstop. Our interviewers are doing several interviews a day and kids coming through our advocacy center are exposed to all kinds of stuff. So much so that there's times where it takes two or three weeks to get an appointment at our advocacy center if it comes down to it, they would come in in the middle of the night. They'd come in on a weekend. So can't say enough about our facility in my county and the people associated with it. We get Lauren interviewed, and when you interview a child, you let them know, we're going to speak about things that actually happened, real things. I don't want to hear about a spaceship picking you and your family up, and you guys went to Disneyland and got back three hours later. That's <laughs> Maybe it happened. That would be cool. Right. So we stress, we're going to talk about things that really happened. This is a room where we talk about the truth and we talk about facts. Lauren describes what happened that night. And it's a lot like Dan says, but she's got a little bit more detail, I think, because it's not so acute. She's had a week to kind of gather herself. So I remember the beginning of this interview, you do a lot of rapport building between child and interviewer. And... A forensic interviewer will ask questions to get a understanding of your cognitive verbal development and your ability to provide an open narrative. And in this one, Lauren talked about going camping and that she was swimming and she got underwater and she caught a fish. Okay, that's not noteworthy, whatever. A few minutes later when we get into why is Lauren here at the advocacy center today, Lauren says... My mom's friend, Bradley, he touched me inappropriately in my private areas. And then she stops herself and says, wait, not all that happened. Oh, no. Nicole, the interviewer, myself as well, when I hear this, I'm like, oh, shit, we're in trouble. Nicole's done thousands of these. And Nicole is the forensic interviewer. Right. I've talked about Nicole quite a bit in previous episodes. I'm starting to hit the panic button like, oh shit, Lauren just said that she just made something up. And Lauren corrects herself and says, I didn't actually catch a fish when I was swimming. <laughs> it's so disconnected from what she had said minutes earlier, but when Nicole said, you're saying that didn't happen, and she's like, oh, well... The part where I caught the fish didn't happen. The context to that disclosure and then the recantation about the fish is what's compelling to me, yeah. that this girl has her own internal monitor about being truthful, and she felt like that needed to be brought forward. But I marked that down because it was noteworthy to me that she self-corrected and was very specific about what she was not being truthful about, which is the fish. I was impressed with Lauren and Will and their mother very early on. I was just really impressed with this family. So during the interview, the biggest part of Lauren's disclosure is she tells us what clothing she had on at the time, which was later collected by our sexual assault nurse examiner. 
So based on what Lauren is saying, there's going to be DNA probably on the waistband of her underwear. I have potential DNA on swabs and I have potential DNA on clothing items. And I know that the turnaround time is going to be within a few days, right? <laughs> no. We know that DNA takes months. Months. So I'm not going to have that for months. But Lauren has given a disclosure, which gives me probable cause to believe that Bradley did it. So I uh, grab my partner and we start hitting the pavement trying to figure out where Bradley lives. Speaking with Diane, she does not know where Bradley lives, but she knows that Bradley and Mandy are temp staff at a dairy company. We had the description of Mandy's car from the night of the hit and run. I don't have the plate, but I know where the damage is likely to be on this car. And we go to this dairy company and drive around the block and I see there's my suspect vehicle right there. Please let there be damage on this quarter panel of this back bumper. And sure enough, it's there. And the paint transfer from the building to the bumper is there. I'm like, jackpot. This is my car. They've got to be in the building somewhere, right? So I go in and I speak to the floor manager. It's a very sterile setting. So I don't go to the floor ever. I'm just in an upstairs office. And they say, hey, we need the floor manager because there's a detective here. I don't know what the relationships are at these places. So I, the floor manager, was he standing right next to my suspect and says, oh, hey, the police are here. I need to go talk to him. It's always like, don't tell them it's a police. Just say, hey, come to the office. So floor manager comes to me and says, hey, you're looking for Bradley, right? I said, yeah. And if Mandy's here, I'd like to speak to her too. But first, I need to speak to Bradley. My thought is, if I speak to Mandy first, she's immediately going to go to Bradley and be like, hey, I'm getting called into the office to speak to a detective. You better go on a lunch break. Right. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm. In this case, I want to speak to Bradley first. And the manager goes, uh, Bradley's scheduled to work today. He was supposed to be here for his next shift, which was a couple days after our crime. And he never showed up. Hasn't been back. And they let the temp agency know he's fired. Tell him he doesn't need to show back up. And I'm like, that's interesting timing. <laughs> so I decide to leave. And not talk to Mandy. I don't want to talk to Mandy. I tell the manager, hey, basically, I don't want to speak to her. I don't want her to know I was even here. Can you do that for me? He's like, fuck, yeah. I mean, this guy, like, ditched us with no call. And I said, do you have a locker by chance? And the guy says, actually, he did have a locker. And he never returned to take the rest of his personal belongings. I said, I don't know what your policy is. I could write a search warrant for this locker. And he says, oh, our policy is that the lockers are our property. They know that we can search that because we've had employees stealing tools and product. So they have this open policy where their employees know at any point we can search your locker without your consent. In this case, I've got Bradley who has intentionally vacated this job, right? Yes. And he's now absented himself from the job and his locker. That's abandoned property to me. We open it up and there's like a shirt, there's toothpaste, there's, you know, like a little shower kit, something to get cleaned up after work. There's a plastic grocery bag and inside is a consumed styrofoam cup of noodles with a fork inside and a Diet Coke or something. DNA. DNA on that fork, 100%. I grab the noodles, one bag, fork, another bag with gloves. <laughs> I've got that, and the manager tells me where Bradley and Mandy have their paychecks sent. I go to that neighborhood where Bradley and Mandy live and start knocking on the door, and I get nothing. Went back multiple times, no answer. In the days where I'm trying to get a hold of Bradley, I learned from Diane that she had received a call in which Bradley left a voicemail and said, oh, I forgot to tell you, the reason Lauren was so upset that night is because I spanked her. She was being too rough with my girlfriend's son, and I spanked her. Two swats on the bottom, didn't hurt her, but that's when she started crying. Meanwhile, that tiny little 
that little toddler baby was fast asleep, so... Correct. So I wait and wait and wait. Finally, 10 days later, the car is there. Knock on the door. Bradley answers the door, and I recognize him immediately from the varying faces he has with the AKAs. Right, with his aliases. Right. So I'm like, there's my guy. And I say, any idea why I'd want to speak to you? And Bradley has no idea why the police would want to speak to him. And I said, well, I'm investigating a hit and run. Oh, sneaky. When I had seen the car at the work site, I had taken pictures of the exterior of the vehicle, especially the damage. Anticipating someone in these circumstances might not be fully honest. (laughs) And Dan had done a great job at the scene because... All the measurements and photos that he took of the damage to the building corroborates the measurements that I take with the damage to the vehicle. And I said, I see the car here. And he's like, I wasn't involved in any hit and run. He won't even talk about the little misdemeanor hit and run that he was involved in. He's saying he wasn't even there. How much honesty am I going to get? Eventually, Bradley admits that he was at the apartment that night, but there was no hit and run. So the story's growing, right? Now I can at least place him at the crime scene the night of the reported crime. Bradley still has no idea why a detective would want to talk to him about any criminal behavior. I asked Bradley, was there any argument? Was there a blow up that happened at the house? No. I said, well, have you called Diane since the last time you saw her? And he's like, no. I know that two of those calls came in while my brother was standing right next to Diane. Multiple lies. Simple stuff. He could have said, yeah, I called just to let him know we got home that night. Right. I asked Bradley about his relationship with Lauren. Get along well? Yeah, get along great. Uh, I've been in her life for years and things are good. Okay. Diane tells me that She specifically confronted you that night and said, did you touch my daughter? And he's like, I don't recall any conversation like that. He says, I did tell her that night that I had spanked Lauren. I'm like, now we can't keep our facts straight because it took a phone call two weeks after this happened for you to bring up the spanking part. I asked Bradley, other than spanking her, did you touch Lauren at all that night? And... He's like, I might have hugged her. And I said, well, we see some clothing the night of uh, this hit and run that I'm investigating. Any reason why your DNA should be on her undergarments? No. Okay. Basically, he's saying it should be over the pajama pants on the outside, but shouldn't be anywhere near her underwear. I asked Bradley if he was even driving that night, and he says, no. Mandy drove home that night, and I pointed out Mandy's rumored to be heavily intoxicated to the point that she was passed out next to her infant son while all this chaos is going on, and you had to rouse her to get her awake and sprint downstairs. And Bradley says, oh, all right, I did jump in the driver's seat, and I drove away, but I stopped a block away, and I let Mandy drive the rest of the way. There's so much wrong with that statement. First of all, it's a lie. Second of all, it's a terrible idea if she's that intoxicated with a child in the car. Right. So I pointed out the absurdity of his claims and he said, okay, I was scared. His license was suspended because he had a previous driving under the influence conviction. So he's not supposed to be driving and he's worried about he's going to get in trouble if he admits to driving. I let him know this is bigger than you damaging your bumper and the side of a building. So Bradley eventually says, okay, yeah, I drove all the way home. Okay. Tell me about the touching. No touching. I, I spanked her and I hugged her, but no. While we're talking, Mandy comes walking up and I have the other detective hang out with Bradley and I go speak to Mandy. It's clear that Mandy and Bradley have talked about the subject at hand and 
have concocted a story that I'm guessing they had rehearsed because a lot of the answers were verbatim the same. Was there some sort of argument at Diane's apartment? No. I ask, how was the overall tone that night? She's like, oh, jovial. And I was never not by Bradley's side that night. I was with him the entire night. I said, you know, I'll point out again, well, I'm told that you were passed out on a seven-year-old's bed. Is that not true? She goes, that's true. But Bradley was right next to me the whole time. We were like laying in bed with my son and the kids were playing video games and Diane was in her bedroom and he never left my sight. And I said, well, again, you're passed out. Is, is it possible that Bradley would have had occasion to sneak away without you realizing that he had stepped away. And she's like, well, I guess it's possible. But again, I was next to him all night. Unbelievable. Eventually, I get to the point where I ask, well, was Bradley even driving? And Mandy says, no, I drove. And I pointed out to her, <laughs> you're rumored to have been hammered and barely able to make it down the stairs. And now you drove all the way home, which was probably 12 miles. Eventually, Mandy says, okay, yeah, Bradley woke me up. I don't know what happened. I know that there was a lot of yelling and we ran down to the car. And on the way home, Bradley told me, hey, I spanked Lauren and she got upset. And that's why you woke up to chaos. Bradley drove all the way home. We got home and that was it. At the end of that conversation, I arrest Bradley for driving under the influence. He was admittedly drunk that night. I have him getting in a minor crash and then leaving. So I have hit and run. You can do that. You can arrest somebody way after the fact for driving under the influence. You can. You're not going to have the blood alcohol content reading like a breath test or a blood draw. However, you can base it on circumstantial evidence like his demeanor, his motor skills, witness statements, it lends itself to probable cause. In this case, Bradley admits that he's got a suspended license and Bradley admits that he was drinking. So Bradley's been arrested and I use that time to gather as much as I can about this case and I present it to our district attorney's office and Eric gets the case, which I'm happy about. I've worked with Eric on a few cases. He's been on this podcast. Eric is a bulldog, fun to work with. He trusts my judgment. He trusts that when I bring him a case that it's something that he can prove in court. I don't bring him cases when I can't do that. So we take this case to grand jury. Lauren gives the same disclosure that she gave during the forensic interview. Plus the grand jury is able to watch Lauren's interview to get the idea of what did her body language look like when she was asked this particular question? What's her reaction? Juries watch that and they go, oh, she's in the moment right now. She's telling us what happened. The grand jury comes back and they indict Bradley for sexually abusing Lauren. Everything that I allege, the grand jury indicts Bradley on. Between the time that Bradley's been arrested for the misdemeanor hit and run, he's been released. And so I got to track him down again. Now I've got a warrant in hand. I found him at his residence. Let him know you're under arrest. He's like, okay. I wait several months and we get the DNA back. Do they hold him in jail? He was held in jail because of the severity of the charges. So Bradley's skin cells are on Lauren's underwear. And it's not just inside the waistband, it's deeper inside the garment. So now I'm like, okay, this matches up with what Lauren has been saying. And bye-bye, Bradley. That case did not go to trial. Bradley eventually pled guilty and... Those charges were like 12 to 14 years. When he pleads guilty, does he admit that he did it? Or does he plead guilty because he doesn't want to go to trial and maybe get a worse sentence? I think it's a combination of both. When we have a case like this where the prosecutor says, here's the deal that I'm offering, unless the prosecution has handed some evidence that would shake the foundation of the case, 
the offer is never going to get better. In this case, I think Bradley realizes his exposure to this is going to be decades of prison time, or I can just take what they're offering and maybe serve a third or a half of what I could serve if I'm found guilty at trial. And once the DNA came back... He was done. He saw the writing on the wall. Bradley took his guilty plea, and he's in the penalty box for a while. What's great about this case is Will, little rock star. I had fairly infrequent and rare interaction with Will because the gist of my case was Lauren, obviously. But every time I would see Will, he'd like knuckle bump me. Fist bump you? Fist bump. One time I was in the grocery store. This is after the case had already resolved. And I'm just at checkout buying groceries. And I hear, what's up, Dave? (laughs) Just like that. And it's this little kid's voice. And I turn around and I'm like, what's up, Will? (laughs) He's like, things are great, man. Like, just so relaxed. Diane, I remember, was there. And so was Lauren. Lauren remembered me. She was smiling. And I just remember... Being like, this family's going to be okay. They're going to be all right. Yeah. I told Dan about this interaction at the grocery store. I was like, hey, guess who I saw at the grocery store? (laughs) I don't know. Who? I'm like, yeah, I'm just checking out. And I hear, what's up, Dave? (laughs) And uh, when I said that, Dan was like, Will. You knew. He's the first person that came to mind just because my initial impression of him was so profound. Like, he's on another level. Right. Dave, what was it like for you when this report that Dan had taken initially lands on your desk? Did that happen often, that you would get a report forwarded back to you and detectives from your brother? It did not happen very often. It's kind of a crapshoot. I'm happy that Dan was the initial officer on the scene that night. That's so great. I love that Will and Lauren and Diane... It seems like they're going to be all right. Yeah. Diane's strong. Lauren won't put up with shit from anybody. And Will, Will's just funny. (laughs) I do love a story with a happy ending. Thank you so much for bringing us that great case. My pleasure. You're welcome. Small Town Dicks is produced by Gary Scott and Yardley Smith and co-produced by Detectives Dan and Dave. This episode was edited by Logan Heftel, Gary Scott, and me, Yardley Smith. Our associate producers are Aaron Gaynor and The Real Nick Smitty. Our music is composed by John Forrest. Our editors extraordinaire are Logan Heftel and Soren Bajan, with additional editing assistance from Jackie Fulton. And our books are cooked and cats wrangled by Ben Cornwell. If you like what you hear and want to stay up to date with the show, visit us on our website at smalltowndicks.com. Small Town Dicks would like to thank Speech Docs for providing transcripts of this podcast. You can find these transcripts on our episode page at smalltowndicks.com. And for more information about Speech Docs and their service, please go to speechdocs.com. And join the Small Town fam by following us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at at Small Town Dicks. We love hearing from you. And if you support us on Patreon, your subscription will give you access to exclusive content and merchandise that isn't available anywhere else. Go to patreon.com slash smalltowndickspodcast. That's right. Your subscription also makes it possible for us to keep going to small towns across the country in search of the finest, rare, true crime cases told, as always, by the detectives who investigated them. So thanks for listening, small town fam. Nobody's better than you.